Hey, Simon here, and before we start the talk, I want to mention some things. On the blog, you will find tutorials and more links regarding the talk. So if you are interested in more details, check it out. Then I have to say, I didn't do all the effects I will talk about. The major part of them were done by other people and I credited them on the slides in the lower left corner, you can see the names. Then you will see more recordings like this one uh, during the talk because sometimes I wasn't um, satisfied with the details or how I explained it during the talk. So I improved it a little bit, added some more graphics and stuff. So um, don't be confused when sometimes my face appears again in this corner. And last but not least, sometimes we had problems with the camera equipment. So um, the original recording sometimes just is black and uh, you will see a little loading bar uh, uh, until the video comes online again. Thanks for listening and I hope you really like the talk. I wish um, you a great time and if you want, uh, you can leave me some feedback. Uh, yeah, that would be great. So um, have fun. So um, I'm Simon and I would like to talk about uh, some cool stuff we do with textures in some games. Uh, I had the pleasure to work on. So. Just a little short introduction to me. I worked on um, these games like uh, Save 2 and Dex Rebirth, and the latest was Wine. And there I started my career as full time VFX artist. I did some VFX before in the other games, but this was the first time full time effect. And um, the last project, uh, and where I want to talk mainly about, is The Invisible Hours. It's uh, made by Tequila Works, and it's super awesome that they allow me that I can speak here about it because it's not even released. And uh, what you have to know is it's VR, so it's a VR experience. And it's kind of an interactive movie in the sense that the characters have their, like, their fixed um, courses, they, they walk around, they have their daily life, and you can go back in time. So you can stop at every point, and you can go back in time, and you can forward, rewind, whatever you want. So this was kind of challenging for us VFX artists because all the effects should work when they are paused, when you stick your head into that, because uh, in VR you can do that, right? and uh, when you rewind time. So that's kind of, kind of challenging. And uh, the effects I in particular would like to talk about are some leaves, and you can see they auto adapt to the tone, which is kind of nice. Then I would like to talk a little bit about rain. Uh, okay, I, I don't know if you can see it, but it rains there, right? Then we have smoke. So there's one woman in the game who smokes. Oh, it's here. Can you, can you see that? Yeah, there's a little bit of smoke. I'm sorry, this is like gives and shitty compression and VGA and it stutters a little bit, but I hope later you can see it better that uh, there's some smoke which is tracked, tracked behind from her cigarette. And then I would like to talk about some liquid we put in the game. And if you try to put liquid into the game, you know that sometimes that's kind of challenging to do. But first, before we come to this delicious VFX stuff, I have to uh, put some boring theory on you to understand what we do with these textures. Because for all these effects you just saw, one of the base foundation are textures. And um, we have to talk about what, what makes a texture. So this is a texture, has nothing to do with the game, it's just from a personal project. And me as an artist, I was thinking about textures like, okay, to give color to an object. So that's, that's what the texture is doing, right? But actually, I mean, you know, a texture has two, uh, three channels, RGB, and every one of these has eight bits. So that's what every artist knows, right? But when we go really into that, we, we should think about, okay, what's exactly these, these little bits there, right? So that's basically the smallest unit you can um, store on a, on a hard drive. And it can have two states, right? One bit can be zero or can be one. And uh, therefore, you have two states. And if you would have a picture where every pixel supports uh, basically one bit, we could have a nice black and white picture. Uh, not enough for the most artists. So what you do there, you just increase the bit depth, which means you have more bits. And for example, if we would have a bit depth of two, then we would have uh, four different states we could generate with these little nice bits. So in that case, only with adding one more bit, we get four different, let's say, shades of gray we could store in our picture, for example, on our little pixel. And this goes on and on and grows exponentially. So the more, um, the more bits you add, now we have, for example, four states, then we have eight states with just adding one bit more, and then it grows and grows and grows. And there are our 256 shades of gray we all know from our uh, texturing experience, right? Um, 
And if you need more, I mean, usually we as like, like when you do normal textures, we don't use it, but uh, you can even have textures with 16-bit per channel or even 32-bit per channel if you need more precision or something like that. And how is this exactly like, how is this stored? So it's basically, you have your 8 bits and every bit um, gets a special significance assigned and then those are basically added. And now it works kind of a machine where you decide what number you want to store. So if you want to store, for example, now it's just zero, we want to store a one, then we just flip the switch. Basically, we could imagine these bits as little switches, right? You switch on the one and then it's stored, right? And when you want to have a two, then you switch on the two and it's stored. When you want to have a three, then you have to activate two and one and they are added together, right? Uh, so that's how, how it is, this in, in the basic sense work. When you want to have a core, you activate a four. Uh, I, I guess you get the, <laughs> the point here, right? And um, with four bits, for example, we can have um, 15 different uh, states. Uh, uh, actually, it's 16 because we start counting from zero. So zero to 50, right? In Photoshop, you would see a 16 here because we start counting at one. But um, So that's how how does this stored? And if you want to have a blank white in your, uh, in your channel, you could say that uh, you just activate all bits and uh, it's 255. So now we talked about numbers. That's how we can store numbers or in our case, for example, a gray channel in the texture, right? But how does it work with text? Because, I mean, text is text, not numbers, right? And, uh, but the, the basic principle of every computer is just storing bits. So the idea is there was a committee and they decided they did a little table, the ASCII table, right? And there they said, okay, dude, this letter is represented by this bit pattern. And so we store, um, we store text in the computer. So this is, for example, the bit pattern for F. And um, this is the one for A, and this is the one for, for, no, for R, and this is the one for A. And then we have Frankfurt, very, I mean, I mean, the shortened version of Frankfurt, stored in bits. And you notice these, these bits up there, they look exactly, just, I mean, it's just bits, right? Nothing changed. There are no special bits for, uh, for letters and special bits for numbers. It's just, when it comes down to, to like the data, it's just the bits. Which means, when you write a program and you see these eight bits and you read them in and nobody tells you that this is supposed to be a letter, then you could read it as a number. Or maybe you could interpret it as a color value, um, as a gray color value, right? Or if you think like, hey, my program understands color, uh, color, then you could read in this, this, and this together and make a little wonderful color out of it um, by interpreting all the eight bits as RGB values. So what I want to say here is, I had to change my thinking of a, a texture is like, oh yeah, it's, it's there for color. It, when it comes down to, to the basics, it's just data. And what you do with that, that's basically your choice. And yes, you can store text into a texture. This texture contains this text in the sense of um, that I just put in, in the RGB values the bit patterns of like one letter. And then you have this texture and if you would have a program which reads out every channel of the texture and interprets the, the, basically the number value as the um, the letter, which is assigned to the ASCII table, then you could store text in the texture, which uh, makes not really sense, but at least it's possible. It's just an example that, yeah, how, how, uh, how my, my way of thinking had to change for that. And um, actually, we all know, I, I guess we all know when we <laughs> already work with normal maps, uh, some other data type we store into a texture, which is not basically a color, right? When we have just one uh, plane, we can apply a normal map and it looks like color, but actually it's like little vectors which point into different directions and um, and they fake more geometry than there is actually there, right? We have just one big um, quad, uh, but the normal map helps us to imitate more geometry than it's actually there. So, which means that already there we began with storing different data types into textures. Uh, yeah, but still, I, I I don't know why I, I had really strong in my mind, oh, textures are just there for color. Uh, but actually it's like textures are basically a big amount of data and do what you want with that. So that's, now theory is over, <laughs> that's basically um, the, 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 the foundation of what comes now. So let's talk about the leaves. So leaves, I mean, leaves, special, not, not, super, <laughs> not super interesting, right? It's just leaves. But um, 
when you want to, uh, do you see them actually? It's pretty dark, right? What's happening here? Can we close it? Okay, there are some leaves on the ground, okay? And, um, <laughs> and when, you, when you want to place them, you could place them one by one, uh, but this is not good for performance and it takes forever. So usually what you do, you have several leaves in one mesh and then you place them somewhere. But the problem is, when your, when your ground is not flat, then some of them stick to the ground or some of them float. You never can't get it right, right? So that's usually a problem we have with, um, in, in games. So, but when you look at the leaves in, in the game, this is, by the way, a random unlit mode. It's not how the game actually looks. It's just a debug, uh, a debug version. But what you see is they adapt to the ground, right? That's really nice, because now you don't have to care about this, oh, it sticks something into it or not. It's really, really nice for, for level design. And how this is done? So in this case, the, the magic word is a high map. So what's a high map? It's, it's uh, basically just a gray texture but it stores height information and with that you can push up um, polygons. And this is actually exactly what we want to do, right? We want to push up the polygons of the leaves a little bit if there is something below them, like a stone or, or something. So this is um, the basic idea here. And this is our high map. So there, can you see that? I hope you can see it. There's a big island and this is the island where the game is uh, the other actions happen, right, where the game is all about. And I have a huge plane, and there's this uh, high map mapped on. But as you can see, and that's really important, when I move the plane, the texture stays in place, which is important, right? You want to move the, the leaves around, the mesh of the leaves, and you want to know, okay, what, what high values on the texture are below me right now, so that I can adapt, right? So, and we map this in so-called world space. Just a little explanation, I hope you can see this, like there's a little plane and when you move it, texture moves with it, everything is standard, normal, like you would expect it. But if you use world space, the world space uh, for SUVs for this texture, then you see the texture is not moving with the plane anymore when you, when you move it, right? So that's um, in that case exactly what we want. And world space basically just means that you have world coordinates, like, I mean, the world has coordinates, and um, you use these as your UV data and not the UV data which is actually stored in the plane. So here you see coordinate 0 to 1 and there you get a mapping of 1 for your little plane. Um, and when you, when you have a standard plane and you scale it, texture scales with it, everything is uh, normal. Uh, and here you have the, the standard UV layout. If you would have you would like to have more tiling, you would have to multiply the UV layout so that it not, not, uh, doesn't go from 0 to 1 anymore, but from uh, 0 to 1 to 2, and now you have uh, your texture tiled uh, twice. Mm. But in world space, this is different. In world space, when you scale your claim, you know, I mean, you just say, okay, I don't want to use your UVs, I want to use my UVs, which are based on the world coordinates, and therefore you get this huge tiling. So if we have to do <laughs> something against this, because um, uh, this is our this is the island, and we want to we, we want to um, generate this high map as uh, little as necessary, no, as little as possible, but as big as necessary. Uh, so we define the bounds here, and this shall be the area where our high map is created. And uh, after it's created, we have to put it like we, we want to have it exactly projected on this area, right? So uh, this is our little plane, and as you can see, it's, it's tired because the whole area is 16,000 units, right? Which means that now, after we mapped it, our, our texture based on world space, it's 16,000 times tired on our plane. Does that not, not, really, <laughs> not really perfect? But that's not a problem. We just have to scale, basically, our high map which is now really, really little since it's 16,000 uh, times uh, tiled over the surface. So we have to scale it basically, uh, yeah, just bigger. And we do that by basically just dividing the world space units by our uh, width of our bounding box, which is 16,000 something units, right? And with that, we already got it into the right scale. So the only problem now is that it has a little offset. And this is because the origin of the scene is not where our bounty box starts and where, where basically our texture also should start, or the, the UVs of the texture should start. 
but we can fix that easily by offsetting this origin a little bit based on the values we can calculate from our bounty box and where it starts and where it ends and based on the origin of the scene and so we make a little offset and then everything is perfect and then ta -da, it's there and now we can move our plane and it's mapped everything is right and it's just beautiful um, but it was an interesting thing and maybe this is unreal engine specific I would like to, to hear about what, what the, the Quieter guys say about this later. So when you have a normal texture, this is just a standard texture, and it is only one channel, it's a grayscale texture, right? And when you import this to Unreal, everything is fine. As you can see there, uh, the format is G8, which means grayscale 8 bit, 8 bit per channel, and you have just one channel, everything is cool, right? Just for example, if we would change this texture to have four channels, that would be a waste of information. You would have the same little guy, <laughs> the same information in all the channels, and you would have like quadrupled your, your memory. We won't want that. Luckily, Unreal supports that you set this texture to just be grayscale, please, and don't waste space. Problem is, when you have a texture which supports higher bit depth, because we need a little more precision for our high map, yeah? 255 uh, shades of gray are not enough. You can't set it. There's no, there's no grayscale um, uh, uh, setting for HDR textures. So what's basically happening is there, we have a huge amount of, of wasted space and this was just annoying. So it was, maybe, maybe this is Unreal specific, maybe it's not, I, I don't know. But two of our guys, um, I don't remember, Mario and uh, Pablo, they were thinking about this, okay, how can we tackle the problem? And then Pablo wrote a little script. So instead, of capturing the high map data like this, right? Like capturing the whole island. I hope you can see this. There's a, there's a house, you see it from the side. Um, instead of capturing the whole island and storing it in a 32-bit um, texture, they are taking chunks, four chunks of the high map, and storing it basically at first in separate images, 8-bit images, and then using it or storing it in a just standard texture of RGBA. So they uh, yeah, basically divide the information and store it into a normal texture and not an, an HDR texture. And so they don't waste space, which is really good. I mean, it's a 4K texture, so it's, um, it's kind of big. So I, I really like that idea of, uh, yeah, of uh, dealing with this stuff. Um, and now let's talk about rain. Uh, the rain was mainly done by Roman Charm and uh, Mario also uh, uh, tweaked a lot uh, about it and actually the rain would be just I could fill just one talk of the rain so I will go only briefly about it and only in, in the um, regard of, uh, of the high map but oh man you can't see nothing okay it rains yeah usually when you have rain you use maybe particles which just fall down you know or yeah I don't know I guess or, or you, you, you have a 2D plane mapped on your camera and there's like Little, little drops coming, coming down, which means that when you look up, they're, <laughs> they're still uh, going, um, going in the wrong direction because then you would have this perspective impression, but not with that fade. Okay, but, uh, and to have this little, when you look up and the drops come down, right, you would usually use particles. Um, but in our case, the rain uses a mesh, and what you can see here is one drop, it's one, it's one triangle, and here there's a lot of them, just one mesh. So, uh, okay, that's, <laughs> that's not looking like rain. But what you can do in the shaders is you can, you can um, use the time uh, of, of the computer or the game, the game time, right? And it, it's just a variable, it's just a number, it goes up and up and up. And you can combine that with a little node, it's called frac. Um, and what, what it does is it goes from zero to one and then it starts again and again and again and again. And you can multiply that by the, some value. So now it doesn't go from 0 to 1, it goes from 0 to 50, for example. And now you can, you can go into the vertex shader and push down all the vertices of your mesh uh, about this amount. And what this does is, yeah, all the drops going down. And then, since the number starts again from 0 to 50, 0 to 50, 0 to 50, when it is down there, it starts again uh, on top, right? So that, that doesn't look exactly like rain, <laughs> which, which we usually know. So we have to offset these drops. And what you can do is, for example, you could assign them some, 
if you drop some uh, random vertex color, so, so a different um, shade of gray, and then use this as an offset. But in this case, and um, this is the second UV layer, so any dwarf has, has different UVs, right? And these are used as a little offset. So basically what they do, you, you take the number of your UV, and, and remember, the UV space goes from 0 to 1. So when you, when you read out the UVs right now, you get a number of like, I don't know, 0, 0, 0, 0, or something. And you add this to your time, so you offset the time. You're manipulating time for that dwarf. So every dwarf is in a different time, position in time and space. This sounds really like science here. <laughs> but actually what, what comes out of this is that you have this. And this is one match. So you have one dwarf hole and you render all these little dwarfs. And there's a lot of, of more uh, really, really cool stuff what, what Norma implemented here. But for us, the most interesting part is we can use these dwarfs with our high map. And this is not how it's done in our game, but it's just to represent that when we add the, the, the high data in our high map. So like I said, uh, we didn't do that in our game, right? This was just a representation to show you how you could use the high map data on the rain. What actually happens is that as soon as the drop hits something based on the high map data, right? The drop gets scaled down within one frame uh, to the zero, zero, zero of the scene. And then gets scaled up again when its time has come to restart from the top, right? We can, we can make that uh, below a house or something, it's not raining, because that's the usual problem. Also when you have particles and you have no collisions activated because of performance reasons, when you, when you put some rain onto your game, it rains everywhere, also in houses, and you have to have a solution how you can prevent the rain from, from going uh, below your roofs, right? So this could be one solution. Uh, using a high map for for that. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about the smoke. In case I forget, I noted down all the names here. Oh, it's not Mario, it's Mario, but it's a little cut off here. Uh, so when I forget to, to credit the people who worked on that, uh, it's, it's down here. So the smoke. Um, can you see the smoke? Do you see that there's some smoke going off of the cigarette? Okay, good. This is not easy to solve. Um, there are something called, for example, ribbons in Unreal. Like this, you would create little polygons and it's a polystripe which gets longer and longer when you, when you move. You could use something like that for, for, for this effect. But as far as I know, in Unreal at least, you can't just rewind effects. Yeah? You can play them, but if you want to go back in time, that's kind of hard, you can't bake them. So we had to, we had to deal with that problem. Let's talk about the smoke uh, first in, in general and let's come later to how we made it follow the cigarette, right? So the basic idea is just this is a high poly cylinder, a little bit deformed, nothing special about here, standard UVs, and yeah, that's, that's how it works. It's a little bit polygon heavy, but yeah. And uh, then I, I used an uncompressed little texture, a little noise texture, which has a different noise pattern in, uh, in every channel. And this pattern walks over or is animated over the surface of this, uh, this little polytube we just saw. And when you, when you multiply the vertex normals of this polygon with this noise, which is moving over the surface, you get this. Um, I, I am increasing the value over time. Uh, this is not for the game, this is just for a representation so that you see it gets pushed out more and more. Um, and this already looks a little bit like smoky behavior maybe, right? And then I use the gradient to say, okay, please stay, stay, um, how do you say, stay small at the, at the beginning. There, there is the cigarette later, right? And then go, go bigger uh, the more up the smoke goes. And in combination with a little Fresnel effect and a little gradient to make sure that up there it's not popping or something, that you have a smooth transition, right? And with a little extra pattern, you don't see too much, but there's some, some smoke which looks... Actually, here it looks better, here it looks better. You see, you, you get an impression that it looks a little bit like cigarette smoke, right? A few things which are kind of important I forgot to mention in the talk. So I have my notes here and I would like to speak about this now. First, I modified the cylinder a bit in the way that I twisted it. Not super important, but a nice variation. More important is that I didn't multiply the values 
to the vertex normals, I added them. I will show some examples what's the difference there later. And but before that, I would like to talk about the values. Um, the the values coming from the high map are like I said added to the vertex normal. And if we imagine these values as uh, black and white in the diagram basically where uh, the black, black values are represented by a zero and the white values are represented by a one then you see that's only in the positive uh, area of the diagram right from zero to one you get more variation and we will uh, have a look at this in just a second when you subtract uh, 0.5 from that and then multiply by two so what you see is that our color values or our grayscale values in that a case are reaching from minus one to uh, plus one right now right before it was just from zero to one and if you would multiply these values for example with the vertex normal this would mean that now uh, some of the vertex would move inwards uh, and some would move outwards depending on the color value or the gray value in the high map texture right so that's that's kind of cool that gives you more variation Okay, and now let's have a look on the examples. Okay, here you see on the left, you see what happens when we multiply the values with our vertex normals. And on the right, you see how it looks when we add the values to our vertex normals. At the beginning, we only use um, the information of one channel for everything. So it doesn't look super special. And here you see how it looks when we use RGB values, right? Uh, like I said before, we use three uh, color channels to multiply or add to our vertex normals and this is how it looks and now we adjust the color range right like i said before um, to push it from zero to one to minus one to plus one okay and this is how it looks uh, again we use only one color channel here right now and this is how it looks when we use um, all three color channels and we adjust the values like i said before so this looks really nice in comparison to what we had at the beginning, right? So um, this was kind of important. And last but not least, as you see, this cylinder doesn't have the same amount of resolution like I showed before. This was because um, I tested something with this cylinder, but it doesn't matter. It works in both cases. This was just for the presentation and for some testing. So that's it. That's what we done. So it's basically a mesh with some with some vertex offset and a little pattern on it. And this we add to our character. And this is not exactly how you would imagine that smoke behaves, right? It's, <laughs> I mean, we have, to, we have to attach it to the cigarette, but just not, not working perfectly. So the first step was rotating it always that it points upwards. And, um, and I have to uh, thank here Jan from the Unreal Discord channel because he helped me a great deal with that. Um, if you have something to do with Unreal, come to unrealslackers.org. It's a great community, it's a chat where you can get help really quickly. So that's what we did here, right? You see? Oh, cool. It, it's, it points upwards all the time. This is more smoke how we it imagine. But as you can see, I mean, you know, you would expect that it's, it stays a little bit behind her, that, that she doesn't drag all the smoke all the time with her. So uh, for those who are interested, this is the, the network, uh, how you make it look upward all the time. Oh, uh, you, you can have to talk later on my blog. I have a website and there you can find it in the in form of a video. So uh, if you are interested in all these details, you can uh, look at this later. Okay, and this is the basic idea. So the basic idea is, first, the lower part should move and the upper part should be a bit lazy. You know, it should be waited a little bit longer until it follows. And then you rewind time, then of course, the. Um, uh, the, the upper part should move first because that's how it, how it was uh, before in time. And, you know, uh, I hope you get the idea, right? When you go back in time, it should behave exactly like before, but reversed. So that's the basic idea. And uh, I was like, how do we do it? And um, then Mario, Mario said, would it help when we store the position of the cigarette, right? She's walking with the cigarette, the woman. When we store this position in the texture, I was like, what? Storing a position of do it. Textures are for color, right? What are you talking about? And he was like, well, a position in 3D space, it's just three coordinates. In the texture, RGB, it's just three values, right? So it's basically the same, like I said before, it's just data. And what you do with it, is, it's, it depends on you. 
And I was like, okay, that sounds uh, like an adventure. But the problem is the whole uh, part where the, where the woman is smoking is 560, no, 546 seconds, and it's 30 frames per second. So it's 16,000 frames or, or, or um, data points we have to store. That's a lot, man. That's can we do that? I mean, will that not be like two gigabyte data or something? And he's like, well. 128 by 128 picture uh, uh, texture contains more than the pixels we actually need for doing that. And in that moment, it struck me that, well, fuck, a texture, that's a lot of stuff there, right? Because we, we only think of, uh, oh, I at least, like, oh yeah, 128, that's not big. But if you multiply it, that's a lot of data points you can store in there, right? So actually, that's what we. That's what we were doing. So here you see the texture. I did a little script, it's called Blueprints in Unreal, but it's just scripting. And um, it, it just takes for every frame the position of the, of the cigarette and puts it as a pixel into a texture. And as you can see, she moves around and then the colors change, right? Because the, the position is changing. So it, it worked, it was really interesting. Um, it, was, it was a really interesting adventure. And the texture is not, not um, having 8 bits per channel, it's, uh, I think it's uh, 32, so it's an HDR texture because we needed more precision. I will show you later how it would look if you only use 8 bit per channel. Uh, and you should have no filtering and no compression, please. This is really fine and granular data. If your compression messes with the data, you get weird results. And what I do then is I sample not the whole texture and apply it to the, to the mesh. No, I only sample a little part of it. And here you can see how it looks when I would sample only one pixel, right? I sample one and then the next one, next one, next one. And this means that all vertices of, uh, of our cylinder would get the same uh, position data and it would not look like any different than just having it attached to the object and doing nothing, right? And this pixel is the information where the cigarette is right now, okay? And when you sample more pixels, like uh, in a trail of this one, then you get information where the cigarette was, because this is the past, basically, right? And with that, you can map this to the texture. And as you can see here, these um, position information are moving upwards. And at the bottom, the line is always the latest position. This is right now where the cigarette is. And the upper information are where the uh, cigarette was in the past. And here you can see how this applies to the UV layout of the cylinder, right? And you can see that the lower vertices of the cylinder receive always the information where the cigarette is right now. And the upper vertices uh, get the information where the cigarette was some frames before. And the longer you sample your trail, the more lazy uh, the smoke gets, basically. And don't worry, if you want to have um, exact details how this all works, you can have a look at the material, uh, which I hopefully are allowed to publish on my blog. And what it does is, it looks like this. Uh, these are different, um, different strengths of laziness. I can adjust it in the shader. So up there, smoke is not too lazy, and it gets more lazy and more lazy. So it hangs around the more you, you stretch this, this, this parameter in the shader. And yeah, and this is how, how it looks later. So um, here the smoke, it actually works. Um, here you see the reason why we, where we need all these polygons into the, in the smoke tube, because sometimes they move really fast and then the polygons get stretched a little bit so that it uh, doesn't look too, uh, too chunky. We need some kind of resolution. And you can go back in time. There, there you see it, right? It goes back and forth and, and everything is fine. So this is really, really interesting. Was, <laughs> it, was, it was really, like I said, it was an adventure, but it worked out really well, I think. Um, oh yeah, and now, I, uh, like I said, I would like to show you some uh, uh, stuff that go on. Here you see the original, everything is fine, she smokes, smoke follows, everything is cool. If you um, activate filtering, you get really weird results. Sometimes the smoke is in front of time, and then it goes back, and weird stuff is happening, <laughs> because um, uh, when, when, when filtering is applied to the texture, you have, uh, it, it gets kind of blurred when it, when it gets bigger on the screen. So uh, values in between the pictures are um, interpolated, uh, uh, in between the pixels are interpolated, and this results in weird positions. So don't do it. And this is what, what happens when you have only, oh, it's 8-grid position, it tells you. And here you can really see the, 
like here, the stairs, right? So we don't have enough um, precision in our texture when we only use 8 bit per channel. So that's why we need an HDR texture in that color. But like I said, it's just more bits in the channels, right? Nothing scary, just more little happy bits we can, um, we can talk about. And uh, here we have liquid. So let's talk about liquid. What's the problem with liquids in the game, actually? Well, um, I mean, first, that's how the liquid looks <laughs> in our game. Okay. And it, it works quite okay. And what you can do in games, for example, is using both targets. And what this means is you can deform one mesh based on another one. Problem is, both have to have the same topology. If you would remove, I don't know, one vertex here, it wouldn't work anymore. You, you need to have the same, exactly the same topology to use this texture. And you could try to mimic some fluids, right? You, you could have two states, one little water splash on the ground and one falling and then it deforms from one to the other. But the problem with liquids in general is that they, for example, if you have a bottle and you put some whiskey into a glass, at the beginning you have, all, you have no <laughs> liquid at all, then it pours out of the, of the bottle, so you have some polygons forming, then, then it gets more complex, more polygons, and then it splashes into the, uh, into the glass, it gets totally crazy, and you need more and more polygons to represent it. So I had a great idea. Okay, let's do, let's do uh, a liquid simulation and store every frame in just one file, okay? This is one mesh. Uh, this is the whole process of pouring like uh, uh, whiskey into a glass in one file and then apply to every of these meshes, to every of the stages, um, another vertex color. So for example frame 10 of this simulation would have vertex color 10 and frame 11 would have vertex color 11. And then I do a shader which basically hides everything except of that frame you want to show uh, at this point. So what actually happens is Everything is scaled down, only the frame you want in that uh, second is scaled up. So, let's say it worked. It worked. Uh, problem is, we have 100,000 trees in your mesh. You only see, in that case, 640 polygons at the same time. But your vertex shader, I mean, the vertex shader has to uh, scale down all the vertices every frame. So, he is working a lot and you only see a little part of it because everything, the major part of this frame is hidden, right? So that was not, not really cool. And oh, by the way, another one. After I implemented this and everything was done, I showed it to Norman, the, the Norman guy who also did the rain, and he was like, dude, there's a system like that. It's called a limbic. And I was like, it's what? What is a limbic? So a limbic is exactly that. It's a, it's a file format for storing, I mean, they, they can do even more stuff, but one thing, what they can do is doing that. I was like, oh. Really? <laughs> why, why couldn't anyone tell me before? And even worse, like my solution was like 40 megabytes, right? This little mesh was 40 megabytes. I have to say it's on the, uh, yeah, it's on the hard drive, right? And when I tried this with Olympic, I mean, don't name me on these numbers. It's a little bit hard to, to find out exactly how much memory um, is used, but it looked like they managed to save it way better and then there is the, uh, the crazy Norman, I will talk about uh, uh, in a second about this, Norman Houdini solution and there is like 3 megabytes, so I think this is the best solution. So what is this crazy Norman magic thing? Okay, so this is, um, this is our liquid and as I said, in every frame the topology changes, so every frame you need a different amount of uh, triangles somewhere right? uh, and on different positions. So what he's doing, oh, he invented a, a method to make this possible and then the Houdini guys, Houdini is a program which can do crazy cool simulations and they implemented his technology. So how this works is, in Houdini you can define a maximum uh, triangle count, right? And I set this, for example, for this simulation to 640 and this means that every frame uh, which has more triangles get reduced to this maximum amount and those frames who have not as many as many triangles, for example at the beginning of the liquid simulation where only a few are there, then as far as I understood the triangles get um, set to zero, zero, zero in their origin point. So they are basically hidden by the vertex shader. And they create these polygons, these trees, these triangles in 
a cloud like this. So they say, okay, this is the maximum you need for, for, your, for your simulation. And then they store the position of every triangle for every frame into a position texture. And you know this, right? We did this with the smoke for the cigarette, but in that case, it's not just one position, it's like for every triangle, you have three pixels because you need three, uh, three positions for, for uh, every point of the triangle. And then all these triangles are side by side, and every line in the texture is one frame of the whole simulation. Um, and here you can see how this real out looks of this mesh. When we zoom in, then there are little triangles, right? One vertex mapped to one pixel. And then, yeah, there's that through the texture. And every frame, the whole mesh is new applied. And here you can see what's happened in this, uh, in, in this moment. The triangle here doesn't care where it is in the next, in the next uh, frame, right? It's just like reassembled, really. And this is happening in between frames, but at the end, hey, artist is happy because the next frame is, uh, is there and looks uh, really cool. But there's one problem. It, uh, you see that the shading is not perfect, right? It's hard, and usually liquids are, look a bit more soft, right? Um, and the reason is you, you, all these triangles don't, are not connected with each other, right? And therefore they don't share a normal, and therefore they don't share their... Um, it makes it would be like a smoothing group, and they are not smoothed out. So how you deal with that? It's actually, it's... Um, let me see here. It's actually stored in the texture. But the problem is, when I, when I show you... I'm sorry? And we'll have a look at the texture again. Okay, this is our texture, right? So we have, we have um, one pixel contains three information, RGB, and we use that for X, Epsilon, and Z in, in the workspace. And the only um, channel left we have to store some information in is the alpha channel. And in this alpha channel, the normals for, uh, for this, the triangles are, are stored to make them smooth again. But Wait, for, for one normal to store, you need at least, let's say, three information, and you can calculate it down to two. Because um, uh, we know that, that these, these little vectors which are stored in the normal maps, for example, right? We, we know that they have a length of one. This is just because they are normalized, and that's what it means. The, the length is always one. And since we know that, we can remove one of the, um, uh, the three informations, the RGB or the X, Epsilon, Y information, and recalculate that later in the shader. Actually, this is pretty often done in, in games that they just throw away the blue channel of the, um, uh, of the normal map and recalculate it in the shader and instead store, for example, a specular map or something in, in that channel. So, okay, we reduced our information, we want to store to two. But still, we only have one channel. And if we have only one channel, here, for example, is, is an uh, this is my super cool blob, okay? And uh, this is one gray channel. And when I want to add some information, I can do that, right? I can add another blob. But how can I separate it now? How can I store two informations into that one channel and later separate it? I mean, storing not a problem, right? Uh, but but d dividing them later again, this is a problem. I mean, at least for me as an artist, I only thought about this as decimal values, which means I used the color picker for the shirt and grab out the color value and it's, uh, I don't know, 240 or something. But I wouldn't know if there's two information stored in there or just one. But when you think binary, this changes. Because, again, these are our little, little happy bits. And we can think of them as like a group of eight, and then we have 255 uh, uh, possibilities here. Or we can think of them as, a, as two groups of four. I mean, they are still like on the, on the hard disk stored together as eight bits. But when we think of them as two groups, we reduce our, our precision a little bit, right? It's like two times two groups of each um, uh, 16 variations you can store as a maximum, because remember, right, four bits. Uh, allow you to store 16 different values, but maybe this is enough. I mean, maybe we don't even need 256 shades of grey, maybe we only need 16 in that, in that example. So, uh, what you can do is, if we want to store, for example, here we want to store the value 2, and here we want to store the value 4, we can do that. I mean, on, on disk, 
it would look like that, right? They just grow together and it would represent a value of 66. Like here, uh, 64 plus, plus 2, 66. We don't care about this value. When we know that we actually split the value like this, so uh, you should know that, right? You, you, your program has to know it. Then you can split it again, basically, and read out the separate values. And this works. And this is, this is really amazing. I, when, when, when I heard of this, I was like, what? This is crazy. And I tried it. So here, I have two little, little images. And I put them together in one. Actually, you don't see the blob anymore because I had to uh, put the, the color values really near to each other. And, and so they are really dark. But they are both in there, but it's just one texture, it's just one channel. And in Unreal, I made a little shader who separates them again. And you can see, right, you only have 16 um, different shades of grey now, but like I said, maybe this is enough for you. Uh, and it works. This, this is really, really, really nice. Uh, unfortunately, you can't use compression and filtering and uh, lip maps, so it's kind of a niche here, but in, in the case of um, here, it was enough. Because you, you don't see the data visually, you only store um, the vectors. And actually they didn't use 8 bits per channel, uh, I think they used 32 bits for higher precision and then split those in uh, two groups of 16 bits each, so you could, could store your, your little um, vector with high precision. And yeah, this is actually working and therefore you get out this, right? Here you see Nice, smooth, no, uh, no weird, hard shaded uh, polygons, right? So this is really nice, and yeah, uh, I, I was really struck when I heard about this, that it's possible to split one channel into two information. So, okay, so I'm here, where is it? Come on. Eh, eh. Okay, so, and last but not least, I asked on Twitter uh, if there are people who have other ideas for, for using textures in really weird ways. So, I, I want to go really fast about this. Uh, so, one guy was just, okay, I read a file, I don't care about what file it is, I just read it in, in chunks of 8 bit. And then, I, I split it like, I, I only read the last four and the first four, and I map the, the values they represent to this little color table, right? So uh, the first would represent um, number 12, and here this would represent 8, no, no, 4, and then you would map these 8 bits to this color, and what comes out of this is uh, this. So he reads them in files and is like, I don't care about the content, I just represent you file as color. And this is amazing, right? You see, for example, like the MP3, totally compressed, you can't see any any patterns which repeat, but there the TTF font, or, or here you see a lot of empty space. So this is really cool, right? I mean, without, without knowing what file it is, you could maybe, just by looking at it, uh, guess what it is, right? That's, <laughs> that's really nice. Then, also, a really cool example, bone transformation stored in the texture. Here you see the actual texture line, and this animation is stored in the texture. Then facial animation, also stored in the texture. Really, really interesting te technology. Um, developed by Norman Cha again. He's the crazy mastermind be behind all this liquid stuff and Mario Palmero worked on this as well. Then we have uh, one guy who is using this little noise texture, which um, many people use noise textures, but he uses it for bringing a little bit of variation into his um, contours, right? Little, well, kind of a little neat trick, I really liked it. And this is my favorite one, and this is the last one, okay? This little guy has an animation. Um, it's Poichi. And um, Oscar, or uh, it's, it's Oscar, right? So Oscar wanted to have, um, that could apply different helmets, different skins to the, to the face. You would have to store um, different sprite sheets of the animation for that, right? Where every sprite sheet has different helmets in. What he did was, his sprite sheets here has no color information in the original sense, it's UV layout. And it's the UV layout which maps to this atlas. Which means that his project actually looks like that, but he can, he can map this little head weird thingy to his atlas and therefore have one sprite sheet and then have different variations for his, um, for his little guy, which is super cool. And by the way, the atlas is even more high res it's even more high res than the actual sprite sheet, so you get more resolution out of this. Crazy idea, super cool. Um, okay, so last but not least, 
Here are my, my end statements. Everything is binary, right? <laughs> Don't let this tricked by decimal values. Um, uh, textures, it's just data. So do whatever you want with it. And, oh no! Uh, research before you do it tools, right? <laughs> Don't do my nitpick. My uh, okay, thank you a lot. If you want to um, see this talk later in the form of video and get additional content, you can go here, some uh, short D. Uh, and if you have a question or something, you can write me on Twitter or email. Okay, thanks for uh, being here. And actually, I don't know how this works now. Do we do a question round or something? I don't know. So there were two questions uh, at the end of this talk, and one was if a decal could be used for uh, for the leaf thing, right? That you use a decal to put them on the ground, and I would say that's uh, possible. I would imagine it costs a little more since they are blended with the ground, um, and uh, the leaves are just uh, some vertices are pushed up and down, and you don't have to iterate over every pixel. But uh, yeah, tell me if I'm wrong, maybe you know it better regarding the details and all the stuff. But I would say um, this option is cheaper, um, the option uh, Mario implemented here, because only some vertices are pushed around and we already had a high map in memory anyway for the rain. So I would say that's not a waste of, um, of texture memory. So yeah, that, that's my thought at least. And the second question was, if you could bake the smoke position texture in real time, and also there I would say, yeah, it's possible. I mean, the only disadvantage here is that you couldn't go uh, beyond the point in time, basically, uh, until you baked the texture yet. Um, you, you would only bake the, the, the history states and you could go back in time and then you could forward again until the point where you stopped baking, right? So um, I guess it would be possible writing into render targets. I've heard it's kind of costly, but uh, if you can do it, why not? No, yeah, should be possible. Good question. <laughs> so the last thing I want to say here is special thanks to Tequila Works for letting me talk about this and for the great time I had there um, helping out with the game. Um, then to Alex, who kindled my mind regarding the, um, the splitting of the channel because I, before I had no idea how this would be done and he just said, yeah, you have to think binary and then it was, wow, ah, that's how it works. And then special thanks to my buddy Conrad. Uh, he invested hours and hours um, with me to try out if this really works, this channel splitting. And we sit there uh, during the night and trying out in Unreal and making all this stuff happen. And Luis from the Houdini channel, who also uh, helped me a great deal with uh, making all these liquid stuff and understanding how it works with the position texture and the vertex. And you know, you saw it all in the video, right? And thanks to Mario for always pushing me and giving me great ideas. It was great to work with you. And thanks Norman as well, who invested a lot of time to explain how his liquid implementation works under the hut. Thank you, man. And of course, Daniel, who made this really, really cool event um, possible. The digital art conference was great. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for um, letting me speak there. And yeah, I hope you all liked it. And uh, hopefully we see us someday. So see you soon.